here with uh, Maxim Sharaev from uh, Skoltech on neuroimaging data analysis for biomedical problems. So, yeah, please start. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's finished now. Yeah, <laughs> applause. It's finished. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, currently, my topic is called neuroimaging for operations planning, and I'll uh, introduce a couple of tasks that we are doing at Skoltech based on data analysis. So, first of all, uh, we have uh, quite a large number of biomedical partners and educational partners uh, who produce. Um, the tasks uh, provide us with data, problem setting, and then check what we are doing there. And one of uh, these uh, partners are the Institute for Neurosurgery, uh, Bordenko in Moscow, Institute for uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology also. And so the cu current two tasks are related to them. Uh, so a bit introduction, a small introduction about the classes of problems that we're solving. And uh, the first class is classification regression tasks, like for diagnostics, pre uh, treatment outcome prediction. And uh, the illustration will be given by uh, my colleague Kate, uh, who's, uh, who's having the next talk. Then mapping and localization tasks for, uh, this is my uh, topic now uh, for uh, pre-surgical planning and correlational tasks like finding dependencies between uh, different indicators and discovered features uh, in the data. So mapping and localization tasks, the first one uh, is uh, related to Bordenko Institute and it uh, refers to uh, the allocating of brain functional areas between b before the operation. So uh, it is uh, done uh, on the basis of uh, uh, data obtained from uh, our partner Bordenka. And the problem is the following, that uh, before the operation, uh, the surgeons need to, uh, to uh, preliminary know uh, the allocation of uh, functional areas. Uh, the point is that uh, in healthy people, uh, these areas uh, have quite similar locations, but in patients with uh, like, uh, lesions like tumors, uh, this could differ a lot, and that's why we need to map them before the operation. So during the operation, uh, the surgeons perform uh, intraoperative cortical stimulation, like sometimes in, uh, when a person is awake. Uh, but uh, they also need to know the pre preliminary location before the operation. And nowadays, it is usually performed with a task-based functional MRI. And uh, uh, this has several disadvantages. First of all, a person should be uh, con in, in, uh, conscious and uh, should be able to perform tasks. Uh, it takes quite a lot of time for each uh, task to be mapped, like motor, motor task, uh, language task, visual task, and so on. And uh, so the problem is that uh, it is not always possible. Sometimes the persons are unconscious. So we try to do it uh, with the help of uh, resting state functional MRI, and uh, the result that we obtained showed that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, somehow possible. So, uh, and no, this is not the point. Well, so why, why it is possible? Yeah, because of the existence of uh, resting state networks in the human brain, which reflect uh, brain functional architecture. Uh, also, when person is not doing anything. The problem here is how to find a specific network and to precise uh, localize the uh, areas which uh, correspond to, for example, language task. And uh, uh, the, p the point here is that it's possible to um, uh, perform a couple of constraints on the uh, ICA uh, procedure. And these constraints, uh, so I'll skip it, uh, these, these constraints are taken as follows. Uh, we know that uh, in uh, uh, healthy subjects, uh, for example, language areas are located in Brachine Wernicke zone. Uh, and we want to, uh, we, we, we know that probably in a patient with, with lesions, these, uh, zone, uh, these areas could uh, move somewhere. But we know the preliminary location of normal people. So we can create universal uh, spatial maps uh, for uh, discovered zones based on uh, normal, anatomy, uh, normal functional anatomy. Then we can adjust it to individual uh, anatomy, this atlas, and use uh, these individual uh, spatial maps as spatial constraints for ICA decomposition task. And, and when, when we did, did so, so this, this doesn't require uh, any mesh, machine learning activity and much data. So this is a purely statistic approach uh, to finding areas based on prior knowledge of uh, uh, areas location. And uh, so now, now the system uh, works quite well. And the, uh, on, the f on, the, on the picture, this is the intersection of task-based uh, uh, task MRI uh, result of finding uh, language areas and our prediction based on resting state. 
And now this, uh, this soft is used uh, in Burdenka and they collect interoperative data. So we have uh, the pre precise locations of uh, the zones which are mapped here. And uh, we receive uh, this data as ground truth and tr uh, now we're trying to implement this data to increase the quality of, uh, of the model. I'll show next how it is done. So these are quite a couple of examples that the comparison of our methods with task-based MRI and intersection. So the, the legend is the following, so propolis tumor of the brain. Uh, uh, the positive uh, cortical stimulation maps are, are white dots and uh, blue dots are negative. So it means that during the operation, uh, the surgeons didn't find activity there. Uh, so these are true negatives for, for in our case. And, uh, and another, another point where uh, task-based fMRI had false positive activations, and uh, we found uh, we found for uh, true true positive, and we avoided uh, true negatives here. For, for another patient. So these are quite uh, a couple of examples what we did. This, this is uh, the overlap between cortical stimulation map and our uh, findings. So the in, in terms of uh, sensitivity and specificity of the model, so the, the first seven patients that we have, so probably it's working quite well for preliminary analysis before the operation. And now, now the, the, the third step, which is planned, we uh, know that during the operation, the quality of the model uh, decreases due uh, to resection and tissue move. And we need uh, to provide the integration with the neural navigation system to have the online update of the model uh, when uh, a part of the brain is resected or it uh, deformates and so on. So we have a, a, a couple of potentially partners who, uh, who, de who uh, uh, who are manufacturers of uh, neurosurgery navigation equipment and we try to do it next when we have the satisfactory uh, quality of the model. And another extension of uh, where machine learning is, is, is going to be used. So first we receive unique interoperative data. We have lesion masks and uh, cortical stimulation map uh, during the operation. And uh, there are some works uh, like built on a human connectome project, for example, with normal anatomy uh, and uh, when healthy people, that it is possible to predict uh, uh, language, for example, areas activation based only on the um, dec decomposition of resting state functional MRI activity. So uh, the database is quite big. It's something about 1,000 uh, subjects. And uh, that's why we can uh, use uh, these like transfer learning and have additional features how to predict the task activation based on resting state and incorporating lesion mask and incorporating uh, CSM, CSM maps of previous patients. And an another, another topic here is uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, localization of uh, epileptic genic foci. This is uh, another mapping task because there are some forms of epilepsy which are uh, drug resistant and the only cure is the removal of uh, epileptic genic foci. And uh, some, uh, some, uh, it's, there are some M MRI positive cases where uh, a radiologist could uh, map these uh, lesions, but uh, sometimes it takes too much time uh, to a uh, surgeon to analyze these pictures, a couple of hours, and many, and, um, and many radiologists are not so experienced to find these areas. So we need to, uh, perf uh, to create a system which works uh, quite well compared to the average uh, radiologist or tries to be the same as, as, uh, as much as possible, the same as a high qualified radiologist. So for I in case to uh, solve these tasks uh, in, a, in deep learning models and computer vision, we need lots of labeled data with uh, marked lesions of uh, cortical dys dysplasias and so on. And this is very expensive because it takes too much time for one, uh, one uh, MRI to be labeled. That's why on the first stage we created a system for uh, brain segmentation uh, based on free software software which uh, doesn't work well on uh, uh, patients with lesions uh, because, of, uh, because of lesions. It's not, not, not normal anatomy. So like an extension of uh, free surfer which maps these areas. Uh, and then, uh, then the radiologist should say whether it's, uh, it is mapped okay or not. So it's like the help of, of labeling. And next, uh, the approach is called weekly supervised learning when we do not need to uh, precisely label each uh, voxel of, uh, of uh, the picture. We need to create a bounding box and there, there is a cascade of neural networks. First, first of them predict the, the location of the bounding box, and another, uh, another step predicts the uh, pure location of uh, the region in this bounding box. So this, is, this looks like this. This is a precise map. This is bounding box, and this is just the slice, when we say whether there is a problem on the slice or not. 
uh, and the task is uh, to uh, understand the optimal uh, the optimal proportion of uh, these kinds of uh, labeling in order to uh, achieve the best quality and to reduce the costs of labeling. Yeah, and pre 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 preliminary, we tried to do it on three Tesla. We have uh, quite good results. Uh, the accuracy is like, like 90% or more. We tried to do 1.5 Tesla picture segmentation because in Russia, the, the most of scanners uh, in clinics are 1.5 Tesla. And so we tried to do it just to be uh, useful somewhere else. So this, this is it. Thank you. Thank you, quite interesting. Uh, but I have questions related to um, classification of resting state. Uh, uh, if you uh, have um, record resting state in a, a normal subjects, at least, uh, you uh, we know that uh, when people doing nothing, they are doing different things in the mentally. And it might depend uh, very much on the instructions and uh, maybe some expectation about uh, recording settings and so on. Uh, is, is it actually p uh, really possible to keep this uh, set of uh, data homogeneous and can it influence the results of uh, comparing with patients? Uh, thanks. So, uh, as, I, as I understand, the question rel uh, relates to the databases that we use, yeah? like external databases with thousands of people. Okay, so uh, the point with resting state is the following. So, uh, the activity of the brain, which is measured by fMRI, yes, is the superposition of many activities that are going on. And our, our point is just to extract the activity that we need. So, this is the first one, yeah, like, like in those standard decompositions. Uh, the point is that uh, in that database we use for transfer learning, uh, the, uh, they say, so this is a human connectome project, and they say that um, the uh, quality of data is preserved in such a way that they have a common uh, uh, instructions how to, how to uh, instruct uh, the participants, how to do scanning, and it should be the same, uh, almost the same. So there are like open fMRI databases where different uh, labs, they just uh, collaborate in different tasks, and this in human connectome, it is absolutely the same, should be. As they say, it's, this is the first one. Next, the data that we collect uh, in hospitals. Uh, we uh, created a protocol and everyone should be scanned according to the protocol and this, this, the, uh, this, it's the same instructions. So we hope that it will help. Any more questions? So what? what's your Next step, so what, what do you want to do next? Where you're going? Uh, so yeah, now we have this, the, the, all of projects are quite long in time. In the, on a, a functional MRI project, we are collecting data, uh, this interoperative data and uh, functional MRI resting state data on uh, the large cohort of, of uh, subjects. And we are trying to uh, implement this system into neural navigation. That's why I supposed uh, in Samara State Medical uh, Institute, uh, there are some, I don't know, developing te te teams who, de who develop some neural navigation uh, system. If, if they're here, just we could, we could talk to, to, to them. So it would be very nice to, uh, c to create an online updating system based on this equipment. And uh, uh, according to uh, epileptical studies, um, there, are, uh, th there is a big problem that epileptic protocols differ very much between uh, different centers. For example, we now in Moscow work with Salavyov Center, with uh, Center of Kolakov, with, of uh, obstetrics and gynecology, and with Piragov Center. And all of them have uh, different scanning protocols, different sequences, different se sequences, different slices, and so on and so forth. So uh, the main target is uh, to create a couple of uh, unification approaches just to be able to work with these uh, kinds of data. And this is, this is the, the four, former steps. Mm. Yeah, yeah, uh, very interesting. And so in Freiburg, we are also um, working on virtual reality uh, setups for uh, pre-neurosurgical planning. So maybe there's some... Yes, uh, uh, regarding uh, virtual reality, we're, with colleagues from Bourdain Institute, we're trying now to, be, uh, they ha to build a three-dimensional three atlas of normal anatomy. So they already have it. They want to uh, create a neuro uh, training set based on, on this uh, atlas, uh, incorporating uh, some lesions like uh, 
uh, putting tumors there just into normal normal things and uh, adding uh, virtual reality and uh, the uh, equipment with feedback just to be able to do some manipulations so this is quite a, another another direction yeah and, and wh where where would you see more potential like virtual reality or augmented reality or do you think both has its place uh, I think uh, in the case of neurosurgery, it is more about virtual reality because uh, I, I looked both on uh, augmented and virtual and virtual lets you uh, see the same thing uh, the surgeon sees into the microscope because no one no one looks at the, the, uh, the skull and the brain yes, and they, they put the microscope uh, into the brain and they operate there and it, it's like virtual reality, they, they see it all the time, they don't see their hands. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this. So we then we come to to our next uh, speaker, Johannes uh, Grünwald and colleagues from GTEC in Austria will speak about um, optimal high gamma band power estimation and denoising for invasive brain computer interfaces. So. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present some very recent results from my PhD thesis. It's actually not directly related to machine learning, but it's one step before that. So it's about uh, feature extraction for invasive brain computer interfaces. So, how does this work? Okay. Um, yeah, as you can guess from the title, I'm working with invasive BCIs, um, which operate on brain waves recorded from the um, electrocorticogram. And I'm mainly looking into the band power in brain waves. So we all agree that high gamma activation is um, an extremely valuable resource of information for invasive PCIs. And like in principle, this happens when a cortical region gets active due to some task, then the power in frequency components above 50 hertz increase, and um, the power, this power change um, is something we want to estimate. And it's quite popular to do so. And there are many estimators out there to do so. However, I found it quite surprising that I wasn't able to find a quantitative uh, performance evaluation of all those estimators. And moreover, um, I felt the lack of really the optimal band power estimator, the optimal high gamma estimator. So this was uh, the fact that motivated my research. So let's go briefly over the methods I investigated. So these ones uh, you can consider the state of the art. Um, they roughly reduced to Hilbert um, and in envelope based methods where you compute the square root envelope of the analytical signal, band pass signal. Uh, the straightforward band um, power signal um, obtained by like power computation from the band pass uh, signal. Um, and then there are also time frequency methods based on in this case, I took the short time Fourier transform or autoregressive models. Um, there are a couple of more, but I didn't want to go too much into detail there. And um, I came up with, uh, like this was one approach I published uh, in the conference paper two years ago, which is like the optimal high gamma estimator from my point of view. And uh, considerably more work was involved when then developing the optimal denoiser. Um, so this is um, currently uh, in preparation for a journal publication. Um, so for the next and upcoming slides, keep in mind that all those estimators somehow feature a window. Um, the, the top two methods, uh, this window is for um, smoothing the signal because in initially it's very noisy. And uh, this, the time frequency methods, um, since they are, uh, you know, you're going into the spectral domain, you also need a window to compute that. And also for the method I propose, I need a window. So this will be discussed a little bit more in detail. All right, so let's start uh, from scratch. I established a very simple signal model in the spectral domain where I have a baseline PSD, and uh, which is modulated by an activation signal, um, by an activation pattern. So this is straightforward. And the signal path I came up with um, involves a whitening stage in the time domain in the very first step. So this is frequently done in frequency domain, but it's uh, lesser known that it also can be done in whitening domain, and it's quite simple. So this balances out all the frequency components of the signal. Then we are doing bandpass filtering. We are removing all the components we do not want to use. We are computing the power. And finally, we have to do a log transformation um, 
to decouple the mean and the variance of the resulting signal. So this is crucial. So we are now at the end of the estimation path. We have a variable x of n, which is our estimate. And uh, we were able to show that uh, this is actually the composition of S of n, which can be related to the underlying activation signal, and a noise term W of n. And we were able to show that this noise term is additive, it's stationary, uh, with known variance, so we exactly know this variance, and we can consider it white and Gaussian. So these are extremely important terms for statistical signal processing. Um, yeah, and how to proceed with this um, like information? Um, if we have a measurement model like this, the statistically optimal tool to reconstruct the signal S from the noisy observations X of N is Kalman filtering. So this is the next step. Um, Kalman filters operate on two equations. So the measurement equation you know already from the previous slide. Uh, and But they also require a system equation. So this system equation defines how we expect the signal to be. So actually we don't have any idea how the high gamma signal like behaves or how 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 it uh, it's yeah like the time course is, um, but for good reasons we chose the random walk here, which is a first order uh, autoregressive model with feedback coefficient one. So that's quite simple but heavily used and uh, quite common, and it features uh, a noise term u um, of n, which is additive white and Gaussian. However, we we don't know the variance of this noise term, and this is quite obvious um, because since we don't know actually if the high gamma signal is flat or it's it's uh, in a very active state, um, this is actually the the variance of this process noise is really um, reflecting this kind of activation. So if the noise variance is very low, we are expecting a very smooth high gamma signal, and if the variance is large, then uh, we expect it to have uh, large transient components. So since we don't know it, we have to estimate it, and that's why we are using adaptive adaptive common filtering. It took me quite a while to figure out how to do it, um, but uh, here is the signal path, and uh, let's not go too much into detail. Um, the only thing I want to mention is that um, we are able to, uh, yeah, we have like optimally estimated the process noise variance from the input data, and it's based on an autocorrelation of the innovation process. So the innovation process is just the difference between the incoming signal and the current estimate. We are autocorrelating this, and then we have a linear estimator for the process noise variance. Um, and moreover, it's not only a linear estimate, but it's also the best linear unbiased estimate, so it's statistically optimal. Uh, the signal path is causal, and the delay is just according to the window size. So since we are doing correlation, we have a window, and uh, we, we run into a delay. Uh, we have implemented it in the C++ max function, and we observed that it's much faster than real time, so this is also a very valuable um, property. All right, so how do we evaluate um, the state of the art and our novel approaches? So first of all, we really wanted to do a comprehensive evaluation. So we took three different um, behavioral experiments based on listening, based on hand motor, and on visual categorization. So these are different tasks. They involve different cortical regions, uh, and they are have different timings, as you can see from the numbers here. And the data was acquired in Asekawa in Japan with our uh, collaborator, Dr. Kamada, and at uh, Albany Medical um, Center by Garvin Schalk. So before we go to the real uh, data, uh, we had to do an, uh, like a preliminary step with synthetic data. So um, what we did here is we, we like generated uh, synthetic ECOG data uh, with as just as a random process with a one over F uh, spectrum. And then we modulated the high gamma amplitudes with an activation curve we we know and uh, where we expect it to correspond roughly to the to, to somehow to, uh, the experimental protocol. So we created one representative data set for each experiment, and then we evaluated the estimated performance with respect to the window size. So this is what I mentioned earlier. Um, here you see the mean squared error over, I mean here it's called look ahead, but it's just half the window size. Um, so what you can observe here is, first of all, the adaptive Kalman filter provides the lowest mean squared error relative to all other methods for all window sizes. And secondly, um, you can see kind of sweet spots for the different reference methods um, depending on the measurement protocol. So this is the visual categorization protocol. It, ha is, it has quite a fast um, sequence. So of course, the window size will be smaller to get good data. 
However, for the Kalman filter, the window size, um, it, 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 it matters, of course, towards um, smaller windows, but the larger the window gets, the better we are in our estimates, which is quite obvious because we have more information. Um, right, so for a comparison on that first, first I have uh, an illustration of the state of the art. So this is just the raw log band power. Uh, Hilbert transform data looks quite uh, similar. And here we have the adaptive Kalman filter result. So you can see already visually that uh, it's much cleaner um, when you're doing, uh, when you're using our method. This is uh, the listening, uh, the listening uh, experiment where here we had a silence period and here um, we have some cortical activation due to auditory input. Of course, this is still, still synthetic data and you can see the ground truth behind in, in like the gray shaded lines. So just to give you some, some numbers, um, we compared the mean squared error at the sweet spots and have observed that for all experiments, on average, um, the mean squared error decreases um, when we go for adaptive Kalman filtering. So next, let's go to the real deal, to the real measurements um, where we are processing the data based on the window size we obtained from the synthetic data. So this was the important initial step. However, here we don't have a ground truth available because we just don't know it. So we resorted to C-scores, which is a very common tool here. Um, and it's quite applicable because we uh, have uh, a baseline and, and an activation period. So I'm running out of time, but I'm almost done. Uh, we compared the C-scores in terms of point clouds and computed like uh, sensitivity increase. Uh, and yeah, adaptive karma filtering just shows better results. You can also see it here. Uh, sorry, here from the from the time courses. So also for uh, for experimental data, um, it seems like we have found a better method um, which outperforms the state of the art. All right. Um, yeah. Since I'm running out of time, I think I have like uh, told you everything you needed. We have some exciting results. I'm quite happy about it, and I think the applications are also quite evident because when we improve the features, of course, the BCI application can be expected to also improve. So thanks for your attention, and I'm ready for any questions. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Actually, I found the man to talk to after the session. Don't go away, please, okay? Okay, uh, I have a question. The, the first question was, is if you go back to slides, just up. Yeah, here, yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, I, I find it interesting that the, for the listening component, you have you have basically the envelope of gamma, which is much more, like much less smooth than that for the motor, hand motor, and visual categorization. Uh, why that? Look, look at, it, at the time scale. So the listening paradigm has 20 seconds, and the hand motor experiment is just much shorter. Just while we have the discussion, could maybe the next speaker, who is uh, Kate, Contrateva, yeah, from Oscoltec. Is she here? Uh, could you already set up your presentation? Great. Um, Three minutes left for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I guess you're continuing working on that now. So have you tried to see if when you do ECOG decoding based on gamma power, does it make a big difference to have this new estimator? in terms of decoding performance, for instance? Thanks. Actu actually, these are the next steps, so I continue working on that. Um, but I cannot give you any, any concrete results yet. Because we, we, we are doing a little bit similar work, but not in terms of gamma detection, but in terms of designing a filter that would give the smallest latency in estimating the, let's say, alpha power envelope, right? Uh, and so when we were doing the comparison, we were not just taking the methods, we were also doing grid search over different parameters of the methods, like, you know, the main in each method, like you mentioned AR, AR order, for instance, you mentioned STFT. The STFT can be done differently. You can take the signal, you can reflect the signal with respect to the current moment and get efficiently more data, you know, and more focused on the current moment. So there is a lot of different ways how you can improve the classical methods uh, to squeeze as much as possible perform performance to compare to the potentially optimal approach that you develop. So, yeah, so what can you comment on that? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I try to be as honest as possible and to optimize the reference method as much as possible. So, for example, um, when you're talking about STFT or spectral methods, I use the handing window uh, and I, I, I computed the frequency bins such that they can easily accumulate it to the, to the frequency range. So I really tried not, you know, to, to win by, by tricking. The only parameter which is really um, unknown and which has to be determined uh, experimentally is like the window size, the smoothness of those, because this is highly experiment dependent. We, we have to change the order again um, because of a technical problem. So we will would now jump to the origi original number three, would, which would be uh, um, Dimitri um, Altukov. Hi, great. And uh, who will speak about um, Cognicraph, a real-time EG-based source imaging software. Great. Okay. So. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today I'm happy to present you our uh, results towards efforts uh, to build your real-time EG processing and visualization software uh, with a focus on the source reconstruction in real time. And uh, the reason why we want source reconstruction in real time is coming from the recently accumulated in the literature evidence that source reconstruction could really boost the performance of BCI. So here on the slide, I present you two recent papers. The left one is coming, um, do I have, never mind. Um, the left paper is from 2016 by Bin He, and uh, which he created for command motor imagery BCI and uh, compared its performance on the uh, sensor level decoding and uh, on the sources. And as you can see from the confusion mat matrices on the on the bottom of the left part of the, of the slide. Um, uh, if you look at the diagonal, you can see that uh, he achieved a boost of uh, performance when he was decoding from sources up to 15% compared to the sensor level classification. And uh, in a paper from 2013 uh, on the right part of the slide, uh, <coughs> authors built um, MEG for command BCI and they, uh, they showed even higher boost in performance. So with that in mind, we plan to build a software uh, which would be capable first of real-time brain activity visualization in order for us to inspect the features in the source space which we extract. Uh, second, we wanted our inverse problem solution uh, to be obtained with dynamic and static methods, uh, which include minimum, minimum norm estimate, minimum current estimate, and adaptive spatial filtering. And by dynamic methods, I mean that uh, these methods, uh, such as adaptive beamforming or minimum current, uh, they really adapt to data, which means that when new chunk of data arrives, uh, they have to uh, modify their inverse operator. So um, uh, on each uh, time slice, the inverse operator is different, which is computationally challenging, but it also gives you better performance. Um, uh, we were aiming at minimal refresh rate of 10 hertz uh, on the source space of uh, up to <coughs> of over 3,000 cortical sources. And uh, we realized that in order to uh, deliver high quality signal, we would also need to somehow deal with ocular, heart, and muscular artifacts. Um, also, we <coughs> aimed at uh, implementing dynamic, dynamic connectivity estimation and visualization in order to be able to try that as features for decoding later. And in general, the idea was to build a platform for source space uh, decoding, which would be capable of computing features in the source space and stream them to a decoding pipeline. So now I'm going to show you how that worked. So here on this video is the interface of the software of built. On the middle pane, I'm showing you source reconstruction using adaptive beamforming uh, on the simulated data. And the activity is uh, thresholded. Uh, so uh, that's why you see uh, most of the brain going in white. But the threshold can be changed. And uh, with that, uh, lowering it down, you can see more activation spread across the brain. <coughs> so uh, with that, you can. Uh, really tune your visualization and uh, going lower you can see more activation going on but of course uh, that means that you would also rec reconstruct some noise. 
um, one of the main features of uh, Cognigraph software is that uh, it's supposed to be really dynamic. And here I'm showing you how on the go you can change the forward model which is used for source reconstruction. So uh, this feature can be really useful when you're trying to achieve more accuracy at source decoding. And uh, <coughs> in, in that case you can just upload a forward model which uh, was computed for a greater number of cortical sources which give you more resolution. And if you want to compute faster, you can just upload the forward model with a uh, fewer number of cortical sources. <coughs> Another thing you can change dynamically is the source of input. So at first I showed you the simulated data where the activation was coming from the occipital regions. Now I switched the data. Uh, so now the activation is coming from motor regions. And when the activation is present, the solution gets really focal. and when the, uh, there is no activation, it gets really spread because it's noise, basically. So, <coughs> about the interface, uh, on the rightmost panel, I'm showing you uh, the uh, signals from coming from sensors here. Uh, in our case, they're filtered in alpha frequency band because that's how the simulations were made. We're trying to recover alpha activations. And on the leftmost panel, uh, there are controls for each step of the processing pipeline, which you also can change dynamically, and you can change the processing pipeline itself. So you can uh, add or remove processing nodes, you can save the results on each step of processing to a file, and so on. Um, other feature I wanted to share with you, I need to skip a bit. Because it's not quite loading. So uh, another useful feature that we've implemented in our software is the capability to record GIF animation from the source reconstruction. So here I'm just clicking on this button, uh, and at that instant I start recording, uh, start recording uh, images from the central pane. And when I click uh, this button again, I can just save this animation uh, to show somebody later. So. Here is the uh, GIF animation I saved on the previous video. It can be really useful to share your results or for teaching, for example. So another useful feature which we've implemented in our software is the capability to look into certain regions of interest um, <coughs> in sources. So uh, in this menu, uh, you can just uh, click on the regions of interest you, uh, regions of interest you want to show activity in. Uh, they're depicted here. And then when you click OK, you can uh, basically reconstruct time series coming from that sources. And you can use that later as uh, decoding features. So here when I click Start and launch my pipeline, on the rightmost pane, I get the uh, time, sources, time courses reconstructed in the regions of interest I selected. The signal goes really smooth because uh, uh, here I use envelope extraction instead of uh, oscillations themselves. So I'm looking into alpha power in these regions and I've selected regions here. Here is the short video uh, showing how we went about the connectivity visualization and estimation. So uh, basically here on the rightmost panel I'm showing the all-to-all -all connectivity which is computed in real time <coughs> showing the strongest connections. And here are some results, some uh, demonstration demonstrations on real data. I'm sorry, just a second till the video starts. Yep. Uh, so here is my colleague uh, wearing an EG cap, and uh, I'm streaming uh, his brain signals online to Cognigraph and uh, trying to reconstruct uh, what's going on. So on the central video, he's uh, closing and opening his eyes. Um, and I'm reconstructing alpha suppression in the occipital areas. And the left and uh, rightmost videos are showing uh, motor activity suppression when he's moving his limbs. So for those who are interested, there are some implementation details. Everything was built using Python uh, on top of NumPy, SciPy, and uh, MNEPython heavily. Uh, I used uh, number package for just-in-time compilations for performance critical parts. Uh, the graphical user interface uh, was built using PyQt. Uh, and for 3D visualization, I used the awesome package uh, VSPy, which allows you to use OpenGL primitives inside Python 
which makes your visualization really fast. And for data streaming, uh, I use lab streaming layer, layer protocol, which uh, is implemented in Python in PyLSL package. Um, about some applications, uh, I've already mentioned non-invasive brain-computer interfaces, but also it could be used for real-time experiment monitoring, uh, neurofeedback, uh, in real-time interactive activity for epileptic patients, and uh, for offline data visualization and uh, examination, for example, for analysis or in class for teaching purposes. So many thanks to Neurobotics company who funded the project and uh, pushed it forward and uh, tested it. To my friend Etienne, from whom I learned how to do 3D visualization and for his package with Brain, and to organizers of this conference for a wonderful opportunity to present here. Uh, please find us on GitHub and... Uh... Oh no, yep, thank you. Software seems very interesting. So I have a question. Maybe a bit beyond that, but you mentioned at the beginning that one of the goals of this software is to use a real-time universe solution for real-time decoding because it's superior to work in the source space as compared to the sensor space. And actually, there's a, a debate on that because most of the approach based on the sensor space do not use any special filtering, but the inverse solution do. So have you compared your approach to like common special pattern or these other types of special filter, data-driven special filter? Because it seems both approaches, both inverse solution and data-driven special filters, both increase a lot the performance as compared to purely sensor-based results. So I don't know if you have any experience with that. Uh, we didn't really compare yet, but that's the next step in using the software. Uh, at least the opportunity to compare will be there. So we could build some pipelines and compare them later. Uh, but uh, what I thought, why this could be possible, because if you do CSP, you essentially do linear processing of your EEG or whatever, your channel data, and what is a hope why the source space decoding what been here promotes, right? Why it can be working better just because you take it into the cortex and then you uh, you do nonlinear processing, right? You do you know absolute values, and this step may be something extra that you do as compared to the CSP based approaches, okay, so that, 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 that that's how I, and also we can think of initializing the deep learning methods because theoretically we can build the deep learning techniques and we can initialize, this, you know, based on those spatial filters obtained from inverse decoders, but for specific brain regions which we find using this software. So I think there is a room for application in this. So there was a question back there. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, have you checked how sensitive the reconstruction is to the electrode placement? So the electro uh, it, de it depends on the inverse solver you use. If you use minimum norm estimate, it's more or less stable. For beamformers, uh, it's more critical to use accurate forward models. Uh, have so you checked that? Yeah, of course. And so what's the results? Uh, the results, uh, exactly what, uh, what I've told you. I mean, I don't have any pictures on that, but ah. uh, it's, uh, it's uh, more or less general knowledge right, thank about you. this. The next presentation uh, by, <coughs> uh, by, by Bogdan, uh, who will uh, from the NRC Institute in Moscow, and he will uh, talk about considering the classifier variance in vision hyperparameter optimization. So, hello, dear colleagues. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about some uh, optimization approach uh, for finding uh, optimal hyperparameters for your. BCI classifiers. Uh, first of all, I need to mention that uh, even uh, in this conference, uh, you, with high probability, uh, knew about some uh, new neural network ar architectures for classifying BCI data. And if you will surf through the GitHub, you uh, will find much more uh, new architectures. And uh, with uh, very high probability, you uh, will want to try them on your own BCI data. But uh, uh, with more high probability, uh, developers of these architectures uh, um, feed these uh, networks for their own uh, BCI experiments, not your data. And if you don't have enough students to uh, feed this architecture uh, for your BCI settings, uh, and you don't have a lot of uh, experience with signal processing and neural networks, uh, you will uh, 
want to uh, somehow uh, choose hyperparameters for these networks and uh, for example, if uh, your BCI dataset uh, uh, much fewer than uh, dataset used by developers of the uh, neural network uh, uh, architecture, you uh, won't able to use as much as trainable parameters in this uh, network as authors, or maybe you want to uh, change regularization uh, parameters because uh, uh, dimensionality of your input uh, ep epochs uh, much higher than uh, also of this network and uh, you will uh, most probably use some uh, automatic technique to fit these hyperparameters like localization, number of layers, number of filters, etc. And the oldest approach uh, to solve this problem is grid search, which just uh, uh, try all possible uh, comb uh, combinations of uh, hyperparameter values in some range and random search. Uh, that just try some random uh, combinations of values uh, uh, of hyperparameters. But the problem if uh, your data set is huge, if you have a lot of subjects in your BCA experiment, uh, you will spend a lot of time using these techniques and uh, you really want some better ways to find uh, hyperparameters that fit to your BCI setting. So in this case, there is a more clever and not so popular approach uh, based on Bayesian optimization. It's uh, consider uh, performance of your classifier with respect to the hyperparameters as function, and it's approximate this function with another stochastic function, which calls surrogate function. Uh, so here uh, we see uh, that uh, distribution of uh, uh, classifier performance uh, y with respect to the value of hyperparameter x. And uh, um, most of this uh, approach use so-called uh, acquisition function. Uh, the, you see one of the examples of this acquisition function. It's called expected improvement. So uh, this, functions, uh, this function show uh, which improvement you can get if you try uh, some new hyperparameter value x. And if you uh, maximize this function with respect to x, uh, you will get the value uh, of uh, hyperparameters that uh, will give you an improvement if you uh, use it next time. Uh, so, uh, the um, oldest way to uh, approximate the classifier performance is it's to use uh, Gaussian processes. And uh, Gaussian processes uh, allow, allow you to approximate uh, uh, performance of your classifier with uh, a Gaussian with known uh, mean and uh, variance. And uh, this is, it's easier it's to, uh, to compute analytically, and I want to emphasize you on the parameter uh, sigma n. Sigma n in uh, this setting is a, a sample invariance of your objective function. So it's variance of your classifier performance uh, with respect to hyperparameters. So the problem is that if you uh, set uh, some uh, uh, hyperparameter to a constant and to run your classifier several times, you wouldn't uh, get um, mm, stable results. Uh, each new run uh, classifier will give you some different value of performance. There are several uh, reasons uh, for that because uh, if you use cross-validation, uh, each time you uh, train uh, your classifier on slightly different data set or or, for example, you can use different uh, order of uh, training batches, or you can uh, use a different uh, initial weight in in incision procedures, or you have some um, stochastic uh, regularization techniques like dropout. Uh, so, uh, performance of your classifier wouldn't be very stable. The problem is that uh, um, despite the Gaussian process is known uh, really long, uh, all existence uh, uh, frameworks that allow you to uh, approximate, to optimize hyperparameters uh, uh, of your networks uh, doesn't allow you to um, use uh, sample invariance, different sample invariance for different points of hyperparameter space. The problem is that uh, if you try different values of hyperparameters, uh, the um, shape of loss surface of your network uh, differs. And um, that's why uh, 
variants of uh, your classifier performance is different in different regions of hyperparameter space. And I show you, I want to show a simple example on synthetic data. Uh, here we see uh, just um, an uh, example of uh, how your uh, loss surface uh, uh, might look uh, like. Um, on the x-axis you uh, see uh, something like uh, hyperparameter values and on the, the y-axis uh, you see um, the uh, classifier performance. And um, this is a deterministic function with known uh, mean and uh, known variance uh, in each point of the space and you see that a variance different in different regions of the space. And if you uh, will try to um, approximate uh, this function with uh, fixed uh, sampling variance like in most uh, frameworks uh, using a Gaussian process, you will uh, see such picture. So uh, this Gaussian process uh, fails uh, to fit well to your objective function and you will stuck in the uh, local uh, optima and uh, the result of whole optimization wouldn't be really good. But if you instead of this uh, will uh, update sampling variance parameter uh, in each uh, point of hyperparameter space, uh, the um, Gaussian process will fit much better to your objective function and you uh, be able to uh, find all global uh, optimas of the objective function. So if you will try to uh, use uh, Gaussian process for uh, find the optimal parameters for your own uh, neural network, I really encourage you not to use uh, some uh, uh, pre-coded frameworks, but to implement this procedure by yourself because it uh, really matters. Uh, another approach for uh, this procedure it's uh, for surrogate function uh, proposed in. Um, um, Three person estimators method, uh, and instead of uh, approximating uh, classifier performance with respect of hyperparameters, authors of this method propose to uh, approximate distribution of uh, hyperparameters with respect to classifier performance. And uh, they use uh, two distribution to approximate it. Uh, the D distribution of good uh, hyperparameters, uh, geo-fx geo that produce uh, uh, fire performance higher than some threshold, and uh, distribution of uh, bad hyperparameters, which L of x, which produce um, bad values of classifier performance. The problem is that uh, vanilla algorithms publi published in their paper doesn't allow you to control sample invariance at all. Uh, that's why I propose uh, a really simple hack to um, introduce sample invariance uh, uh, to this method. And um, in our setting, uh, for each hyperparameter value uh, we sampled, we have uh, several uh, possible classifier performance values. And uh, in the um, blue circles uh, we see the easy examples when uh, for each of the sampled uh, hyperparameter value all classifier performance value uh, above the threshold and this uh, hyperparameter values will be used to construct the good distribution, the distribution of geota effects and uh, the red uh, ellipse shows a good example uh, of uh, how uh, sampled hyperparameter values um, all of them below the threshold and this uh, hyper parameter value will be used to construct the bad distribution, the distribution of L of X. But we have problem with uh, uh, hyperparameter values uh, corresponding to the uh, black ellipses because some of the samples below the threshold and some of the sa samples above the threshold. And uh, I propose to use a um, weight mechanism so each uh, uh, sampled hyperparameter value will have a weight and uh, a weight of uh, uh, blue and uh, red uh, ellipses will be uh, twice higher than uh, hyperparameter corresponding to the black ellipses and uh, um, this weights uh, produced by softmax function with temperature and uh, by controlling this temperature you can uh, control um, the uh, exploration with exploitation uh, properties of your algorithm. So uh, here we see the example of high temperature and here we see example with slow temperature. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for an interesting report. Uh, a simple question. Uh, are there any assumptions about uh, the loss function? 
So whether it's convex or not, and the some how was the sh the shape of it? So do you need these? Uh, have you tested any different approaches how to behave? How how it behaves? There is, uh, you don't uh, need to have any uh, assumptions about um, loss function. You even can use it in the uh, closed form. So you just need to sample. You just need the ability to have samples from this uh, loss function. So, so you can even uh, use such kind of function uh, if you can find something like that. That you uh, even don't have formula for them, but you ju only have a possibility to sample from them. So no, no, uh, no assumption at all. You can okay. use uh, uh, non-convex uh, stochastic function and uh, every you can imagine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if there are no more questions, then yeah, thanks again. We come to the next presentation, and now oh, sorry, the next presentation is by Ilya Michiev. Um, and colleagues from the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Is subcortical fMRI only machine learning away from Skype EG? Is uh, this your title? Is, is that right? Yes. So, okay. So, um, okay, but now you wait, if you go back here, you had a different title, right? Can we go back one slide? Predicting subcortical bold signals from concurrent EG. Yeah, that's great. So, okay, so, yeah, please. Uh, my name is Lia, and I'm a master student in High School of Economics and Center of Bioelectric Interfaces. And, topi and today my topic is predicting subcortical bold signal from concurrent EG. Let's start with uh, simple sham that uh, was proposed by Friston in 2005. There are three different methods to integrate EEG and fMRI signal to integrate different modalities of neuroimaging. First of all, it's prediction when you predict EEG of, or bold signal from uh, EEG or bold or, bold or EEG signal. Uh, second method is constraints when you use your bold activity for uh, and putting the dipole for inverse solution and in EEG. And uh, the most difficult method is the fusion with forward models, and uh, it's not very reliable because it's very difficult because we cannot theoretically uh, make this approach. And uh, let's start with the EG from by coupling and what we know now from theory. Uh, by Friston theory, uh, if neural activation increases, there is a <coughs> combinant increase in both signal and a shift in the spectrum of high solar higher frequencies in its theoretical approach. But in the next uh, workings uh, that uh, using concurrent EGF MRI, there I was working with uh, waking monkeys and uh, uh, and the signals from uh, visual cortex. Uh, there are five, uh, there are was finding the linear relationship uh, between frequency bands of EG signal and the bolt activity. It's very important approach, and we can deduce a heuristic equation from these researches. Uh, if uh, our bold signal is uh, from t, from time, we can, uh, we can propose that uh, these activities, these bold activities, uh, linear combinations of uh, different frequency band of EG signal and different weights of these uh, frequency bands. And uh, the next slide is a simple simulation that you simulate your EG signal uh, with different frequency gates. And uh, from this, you uh, modeling uh, filter and uh, modeling your bolt signal. Why this is important? Because signal noise ratio is very important. And if you use linear methods like linear regression or uh, canonical correlation analysis, if you will use uh, the signals with very low signal noise ratio, you cannot extract reliable filters from these signals. But if uh, signal noise ratio increases, you can extract this extract the right weights and right uh, signals of these weights. Uh, signal noise ratio is very important, and uh, 
simultaneously GFMRI recording is uh, very difficult for interpretation because there are many different artifacts from FMRI in, in EG signal. And uh, uh, in this slide, this carbon viral loop is a very effective method for reducing artifacts in the EG signal. You have different loops in different channels and you have sensors in, in, in these loops and these sensors decoding different artifacts. It's ballistic cardiographic, motor, cardi uh, motor artifacts, uh, or gradient artifacts. And using these channels, using signals from these channels, you can, using simple regression, like uh, uh, reductionized new movements from EG signal, it's uh, simplest itself. And uh, in this uh, picture, you can see that how uh, using of cell channels uh, reflecting our frequency spectrum. And uh, uh, how using cell channels uh, is uh, the more simplicity and denoising to our extracted channels. If you will use uh, simple fMRI AG without cell channels, without reducing, without using special sensors for reducing gradient or motor artifacts, if you use ICA or CBA methods or PCA methods, you cannot extract, you will have outliers in your AG signal. Uh, and the next slide is how we can extract the fMRI signal. The fMRI signal is not the image. It's a, if you, if I told about uh, functional fMRI and the, and the first at all, it's a time series. You can use uh, the different, uh, you can use normalization for uh, putting your functional fMRI in normalized space. You can use different MNI coordinates and uh, uh, draw the sphere uh, uh, in these coordinates and extract the signal from that. Or you can use a simple probabilistic atlases. It's atlases that was drawn from many, many participants and this meaning uh, of different subcortical constructions. And using uh, these uh, probabilistic atlases, we can <coughs> uh, we can go from voxels uh, to time to row to region of interest to time. It's from uh, very high dimensional space to very low dimensional space, only two dimensions. Different regions of interest and time points. Let's take up our algorithm description. First of all, we have rho EG with two dimensions, uh, sensors and time. Uh, uh, the second, we have a sliding window for extract the 50 seconds EG samples. We, these uh, different steps, you, we have step for five seconds. Uh, after that, we are planning short time free transform and uh, uh, we uh, can find the EG features. It has uh, three different dimensions, three dimensional space, samples, uh, two sensors, two frequency bands, two delays. The second, we can extract variable signal using probabilistic max. Uh, then we interpolate this signal in the end of each sample in the end uh, in a delay equal to zero. And uh, we can find the fMRI targets, either our features and target space. But three-dimensional space is very difficult. It's, uh, we can use intensive analysis or uh, using different reshaping, but in this uh, working we use two different filters in two different space and balancing those filters using different constraints. In this picture is cosinus. It's two different cosinus in uh, that uh, 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 that's a measure of equality between two vectors in this space. Uh, the second uh, is the most important uh, uh, point is uh, patterns because if you can extract the different weights from different linear methods like regression, you cannot. Uh, you cannot interpret this weights or, or this uh, or their sign. And for this, you need to find the patterns. And uh, the two-dimensional space is a simple covariance between two different vectors. And you can find that how this uh, pattern findings reflects to our topogra topography of our finding signal. Uh, between different, in uh, this slide you can find, you can see the, the right amygdala and left amygdala. We can find the, these sensors reflect this activity in our EG. The second is the patterns in time frequency space. 
if you can see the weights is not very interp in interpretability in uh, this uh, pictures Be and the sign is not very important but if you find the pattern you can find that the, the most important activity in the uh, racing state wakefulness is the alpha band and alpha bands the most total reflect this activity in our brain and let's find the results. We find the 21 subcortical regions, and the, uh, we're using piston correlation coefficients. We're using a uh, 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 two metrics and different metrics, and all metrics is very good. You can see that the average piston for the signals with using several channels for using regression methods for deleting the artifacts from EEG signal is. Uh, uh, and the piece of matrix is higher than uh, they're using simple uh, from Rai AG. Uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, you can see that uh, the average construction accuracy for 21 different subcortical regions, amygdala, thalamus. So you can, f you can find you, you can find that the uh, reflected activity is the uh, reflected part, uh, construction activity is much higher than the using. Uh, from IAG without several channels. And the B picture is, a, we have the simplest metric for, we have the uh, inverse signal uh, for modeling. And the inverse signal uh, gives us uh, the less, uh, the, uh, the less Pearson correlation coefficients when forward signal. It's the simplest metric you, uh, for, that, and if you use the inverse uh, signal, you can uh, into modeling and uh, find that the, if using the forward signal, our model finds the uh, true patterns of this activity. Uh, that's all. Uh, I can find the slide with the time courses of the bolt activity and how the, our methods uh, truly construct this activity but I can show you on my computer. And you can see the all 21 regions that we use probabilistic masks, this reconstruction of use is very high. Thank you. Excuse me for my English, I'm so. Yeah. It's very difficult to talk about. Next um, uh, speaker, Yannick Roy, from uh, the University of Montreal, and uh, he will talk about current trends in deep learning for EEG analysis and how to improve reproducibility of deep learning EEG studies. So, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, just so I can adjust the level of the talk, um, just by a show of hand, who's ever trained a deep learning neural net before? So, okay. Um, so the task that we, uh, that we undertook uh, last year, and we published a paper earlier this year, was to try to understand uh, the trends in deep learning, because it's very exciting, but it was very hard to where do you start, how much data is enough data, what kind of model is working, what kind of model is not working, um, and just how to get started. So there was no review paper in the field for deep learning for EEG. So starting reading papers, reading papers, and then we're like, okay, let's just publish, let's just do a review paper. I didn't really know that reviewing 154 papers would take that long. Um, but uh, now I'm really happy that, that we did it because now we've highlighted a lot of the trends uh, in the field. So basically we took PubMed, uh, Archive, and Google Scholar. We searched for a different bunch of terms and uh, we end up with a lot of papers. Uh, we removed a bunch of them that were not, that were only kind of like one layer that were not necessarily deep learning. Um, the reason why included, including archives and uh, non-peer-reviewed paper was because the field is very early and wanted to know what are people doing, not necessarily the peer-reviewed paper and the, the good papers. So we, thought we had a lot of discussion about that, um, but we decided to include to see where it's going because the field of deep learning and machine learning is evolving very rapidly on archive. Um, so we included these, paper, these papers as well. So what we've seen is that there's definitely a big exponential growth in, uh, in deep learning uh, literature for, uh, for EEG. Uh, definitely in uh, 2019, already doubled uh, what happened last year. So it's happening fast and there's no 
uh, real convergence about the different trends that I'm going to show today. So um, we decided to include different fields, not necessarily just look at BCI, but really deep learning for epilepsy, sleep, BCI, effective and cognitive monitoring. And uh, the first question that, that everybody asks when you talk about deep learning is, how much data is enough data? So how much data do you need to do deep learning? Um, and then you need to ask yourself, how do you look at at the amount of data. Is it the time? Is it the number of examples? Is it the number of subjects? What exactly is the size of data? If you compare with uh, image recognition or in the field of computer vision, it's easy. It's an image, one example. How many images of a cat? How many images of a, of a dog do you have? And that kind of like tells you how, many how much data you have. Um, in the case of, uh, of EEG, we looked at first the recording time. So we converted everything in minutes of recording. And the second is the number of examples. So how many examples are you feeding to your network? I'm going to come back to what exactly an example is. But in the in image, it would be one image. In EEG, it's mainly kind of like a window of, uh, of something, whether it's raw EEG or feature-based. Uh, uh, yeah, feature based. So what we've seen is that there, it's kind of all over the place across different domains. Uh, there is no real uh, people are using small data set. The recording time goes from, um, we see that the, at the bottom in term of, in term of minutes, it, it goes from two minutes uh, for deep learning. Not sure that that's enough, but from two minutes to 4,800,000 minutes. Uh, the big data sets obviously are coming mainly from sleep clinics and epilepsy clinics. Uh, the BCI field, it's a lot in kind of like research labs. It's more in small, smaller samples. Uh, but if we look at the mean and the median, it gives a better uh, approximation of what's happening of like basically a few hours worth of data in terms of the median. Um, same thing for the number of examples. Uh, it goes from a few one, uh, 62 up to uh, 9 million example. Uh, so it really ranged from, uh, from different places. When you convert into the ratio and you look at how many examples do you get in a minute, um, that's very interesting because uh, in sleep, for example, there's a clear standard, if I can say, in terms of how do you uh, window your, your data. Namely, a uh, 30 seconds window is the standard, and this is why we see on the last graph here uh, that there is kind of a clear, clear trend for the ratio, how you leverage your data, and how much example you get from X minute of recording. Um, the next question is, okay, based on the number of subject now instead of the number of, uh, in minutes, so most, very few studies as over 100 subjects, uh, half of them were, uh, had less than 13 subjects. So when we talk about transfer learning and we try to uh, uh, use deep neural net on a pool of subject and then transfer on other subject or use it on new subjects, uh, we're definitely not there in terms of what people have been trying uh, with, uh, with the, the pool of subject that they've been using. Um, but in some cases, they've been using huge data set, namely in epilepsy and sleep, as I said before. The, if you don't have enough data, what can you do? In image processing and other fields, we do what we call image augmentation. So we rotate the image, we add noise, we do a bunch of transformation on the, on the image, and we create new one. In terms of, uh, of EEG, people have tried to add noise. Um, to, uh, to their data, uh, sliding windows is very interesting because nobody, there was, there was definitely no convergence or no um, best practices in terms of sliding windows. What I mean by that is that some of them overlap and by sliding window is that you take a window of time in your EEG, that's one example, then you slide it a little bit and that's another example, you slide it, another example, etc. And uh, some people were using 99% overlap. So are you really creating new data? Uh, yes and no. So that's uh, that's very interesting when you look at how people were sliding their windows. Um, one example, uh, if you look at example number one here, so from 1,000 minutes, some uh, some people used 250 milliseconds window uh, with a, an overlap three uh, of two 35 milliseconds overlap, and that generates roughly four million example. Another case, someone were using 15 minute window. Uh, so with approximately a thousand minute window, window, you have 62 examples. So from 4 million to 62 examples within the same amount of minutes. So it's really all over the place. I think that uh, it's very hard right now to understand what to do. So if you're PhD students or a master, like there is no best practices in, in, in this case. Um, S balancing classes is also a hard challenge uh, for data augmentation. You oversample, undersample in one cases. Uh, so many people were doing different, uh, different ways. And the, the danger with that also sometimes, depending on when you do it, that we've, that we've seen, is that you might do over double dipping. So if you try to uh, uh, regulate your classes at the beginning and then you split into different data sets, you might do, do double dipping without really realizing it. So we've seen a couple of these. 
Um, and uh, people are really excited about GANs, so generative model for EG data, trying to generate new data. So right now, most people use prior expert knowledge, but people are really excited about GANs for, uh, for the future of that. So hardware, I'm going to skip uh, on that one. Uh, Pre-processing, so most people, uh, obviously the holy grail of, e of deep learning is to go towards raw data. So pre-process as less as possible. Same thing for artifact removal and just basically here's my data, do some magic, you're AI, so do something with my data and give me a result. So people are going towards that trend. Uh, some people were still doing uh, a lot of frequency, but the trends over year, so this is the overall amount. But if we look at the trend over year, people are going more towards the raw data and less and less artifact and uh, filtering, pre-processing of the data um, before. So in terms of the architecture, I think one of the most exciting questions is what are people using? Is it CNN? Is it RNN? And with RNN, I'm including LSTM and other recurrent network. Um, and the main one is definitely CNN still. Uh, and RNN came, came second. But really the trend also, a lot of people were trying to combine to, best the to, to get basically the best of both worlds. So CNN is known for mainly spatial uh, features and RNN for temporal and EEG you have both. So a lot of people are trying to combine both, whether it's in parallel or serial, one after the other. Um, so this is a new trend that we've observed with, uh, that happened in 2017 and 18 uh, only. The, the deep learning methodology, I'm gonna skip this one for now, um, just uh, because uh, time, is, time is flying by. So in terms of the, uh, the performance metrics, what, what are people are using to compare one another? Accuracy obviously is the main one, uh, but it's important to note as you go towards big data that your classes might be uh, not balanced. So accuracy might not necessarily be the best, uh, the best metric. So sensitivity, F1 score, specificity, and others might be more appropriate depending on your uh, class balance. So, um, in terms of like cross-validation, really, really important to make sure that you uh, don't double dip and don't uh, uh, test on the same data that you've trained on. So most people are using, as you might expect, keyfold, uh, keyfold cross-validation. Leave one subject out, obviously, in the case when you're trying to do enter subject. So you train on, if you have 10 subjects, you train on nine, and then you test on the 10th the one that you've never seen before. So in, that, in enter subjects, that's the, the preferred method. Um, and speaking of intra versus enter, so the holy grail is really to go enter subject, um, but the best models and as we've seen all the, the, the best results are definitely intra subjects. So you train even a deep learning on one subject, even if you have less data per subject, less data overall, uh, because of the variability, uh, enter subject is quite high. So deep neural net are not necessarily performing better yet. Uh, with the model that we have right now. So this is interesting because I, I'm, I was personally very interested in the uh, in inter-subject generalization, but it performed not as good as the intra-subject one. So, uh, so just to finish quickly on the deep learning, is it really, is it really better? We've observed only a 5% median performance, which might actually just due to the publication bias, uh, typically where you need better results to, uh, to publish. So we don't really know if deep learning is better. That's kind of the conclusion <laughs> right now. Uh, it has a lot of potential, but we don't uh, really know um, if it's really better. So just finish on one slide reproducibility because I thought I would talk more about that, but I thought I had 15 minutes, not 10. Um, but uh, the reproducibility, the, the bottom line of the study, I think that is the most important of the review is that aspect is for deep learning in other fields. Uh, they share code, they share data sets, they, they, they share everything. It goes really fast. They just publish an archive and it goes really, really, really fast in, in EEG. Unfortunately, the cycle of iteration is slow. We don't share data enough. We don't share code. Uh, people were sharing, for example, like the code on their own website or on a G drive, uh, which you wouldn't see in other fields. Uh, GitHub is obviously the, the, the main one. So uh, bottom line, in all the studies that we've seen, only 11 were reproducible where code was accessible, data was accessible, and someone else could reproduce the results. And for deep learning to really happen, I think that we need uh, to share more and to uh, make it more producible. So thank you. A lot for the presentation and uh, yeah, there are already many questions, so please, yeah. 
So, okay, uh, my question is, I have uh, friends who has done quite the same work for uh, genetical studies, and my question is about uh, repro re reproducibility. So they've done the same work, but they uh, uh, indeed uh, follow, uh, do the same calculations and try to reproduce the results. They not only checked if they have code and data, but they've done it. And they found that like they, they can really reproduce one of the three papers which was which uh, they have data and code to re reproduce. So have you done the same? Uh, not only found data and code, but try to do it and to see. So is this reproducibility possibility to reproduce or is it reproduced? So in the review, we only highlighted the numbers and over the summer, we've actually re tried to reproduce the 11 one that, that we've seen. So we're gonna publish a paper and kind of like a follow up on exactly that because even if everything was there, it was not necessarily easy and you wouldn't necessarily get the same thing, uh, the same results, hyperparameters being, uh, being one thing, um, training in different and handing with different results when, uh, when you're training. So yes, we're gonna follow up on, uh, on that. And uh, you can share now what percent uh, it was way harder than, so it wasn't, for example, if you think reproduced, you can get the code data and 15 minutes later you, 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 you get the same results. This is definitely not what, what happened. Especially in deep learning, one of the main challenge if you want to reproduce is versions of toolbox. Like in Python, everything moves so fast that everything is deprecated. It's a paper from last year and then you need to balance with CUDA, with uh, like all, all the different, uh, the, the stack of, of API and toolboxes. Um, so that's a real uh, bit of a nightmare to uh, work with. But that's not the fault of the author who's at that time it was working. Yeah. So, so maybe like Docker, like a full-fledged environment as is, could be a good solution. Uh, that's where we're going with, the, with, the, with that paper, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So um, many of the applications you mentioned actually like for uh, epilepsy, BCI, they are targeted at online application. And so how, I'm curious how many of these papers that we view are actually used online because you cannot cheat online, right? You cannot train your network on the test set. No, so do you know if there's a lot of them or very, very few of them? Very, very few. Uh, I remember that we have a column. So I think that one of the greatest contribution of the review is that the full table, so we basically uh, have a list, like a spreadsheet of all the 150 papers times nine, uh, 70 items that we broke down, like the number of layers and everything, and it's all open. So if you go on dleg.com, uh, you'll find uh, the, the, the spreadsheet. Um, so you have a column, is it online or offline? So you can, uh, but it was really, 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 really tiny as an amount. Uh, and I, I don't even remember that it's considerable as a percentage. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, amazing review. Uh, stack more articles. Uh, so uh, the key point uh, of uh, discussion uh, was uh, uh, interpretation of uh, feature, interpretation of uh, first OS. Uh, my question is uh, uh, how many uh, works, uh, uh, how many articles uh, are about uh, attention uh, wares uh, for feature interpretation uh, of uh, RNN or uh, CNN features? So you mean interpretation, so how many papers have looked at what the neural net has learned? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, my slides are not on anymore. Um, I think that we had... Uh, about, there, there was still a few papers, so definitely uh, I would say maybe one-fifth of the paper or one-sixth, probably more, uh, looked or was interested in looking at what the network have learned. So there's definitely a trend of people trying to explore more. Uh, most of them were not really sure what and to what extent, but uh, there is definitely a quest to try to understand this black box uh, things so we've broken down in the review of kind of like all the different approaches that people were uh, were looking at. Is it do you modify the input? Is it analysis of weight? Uh, so all the different methods that you can try to learn what your network has learned. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and maybe just as an additional little comment to the reproducibility. So I think it's uh, even an interesting question. When would you have reproduced the result? Because in deep learning you have several stochastic elements in the process, like the uh, stochastic gradient descent itself or dropout and so forth. And uh, if you just rerun it yourself, you will not get the same number. So I think this is an inter interesting topic also for the future to set up standards. When would you say it, it, it's reproduced or not? So yeah. And yeah, so, um, so, so, we, so the, the, and the reproducibility in the paper, we, and we try to reproduce and see how many people have, have shared their weights as well. And kind of like the trained model. Uh, not just how to train it and the code, but actually the trained model so that you can test it also as trained. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and uh, so, yeah, thanks again for this uh, great presentation. Come to the next one, staying in the uh, topic area, I, I guess, which would be. Um, yeah, so uh, I Ivan Zubarev from the Department of Neuroscience in uh, Alto University in Finland, and he will talk about MNE, fl MNE flow. Neural Networks for Electromagnetic Brain Measurements. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to first thank the previous speaker because he already voiced a lot of concerns that we've been having. And uh, I think that will make my job a bit easier by uh, motivating what what we're trying to do here. So in this talk, I will try to, 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 ask the, uh, to answer the question why you can still use the neural networks and uh, extract some new information for neuroscience. Uh, that's my primary research because my background is in neuroscience. I just happen to apply machine learning and neural networks in particular for magnetoencephalographic measurements in the last several years. Uh, and uh, well, basically, I would like to start with what what would you do? Uh, like planning the brain decoding study takes a lot of informed choices, uh, uh, preferably during the planning stage already. And uh, ideally, that would be two people doing this job. Uh, one a neuroscientist that uh, would make sure that the uh, that the initial hypothesis is sound, that the measurement technique is adequate to the to the to the type of the activity that you want to measure, and then finally that the experimental design uh, allows an ambiguous interpretation. The machine learning guy uh, which should ensure that there is sufficient amount of data, and that, that the model actually does capture data data irregularities quite well, and there are some sanity checks like you're not doing something. Uh, some beginner mistakes like leaking information from your training set to the validation on a test set all the way. But uh, uh, And then most importantly, these two people should uh, actually able, be able to communicate. Uh, so with that, uh, we our idea was, uh, so we introduced uh, our own convolutional neural network for decoding magnetoencephalographic signals. Uh, but then because of, uh, we have met many concerns and uh, made a lot of errors during the model development, we decided to build a Python package that would uh, basically take care of these two things. Uh, first, implement that the, mo the models that were uh, published and uh, are known to be effective in decoding EEG uh, and MEG signals and do some sanity checks. So the goals are of MNE flow package, uh, I will explain the name quite quite soon. Uh, to implement the, the, the models, to provide the basic workflow, to avoid uh, common pitfalls, uh, especially during the pre-processing, that kind of stuff, and ultimately maybe ultimate, uh, optimize the time for doing actual science, not picking hyperparameters. Uh, so, uh, as the name suggests, we're standing on the shoulders of two giants. First, Emony is a software package for analysis of EEG and MEG. Uh, it provides, uh, well, basically this features and TensorFlow is of course a well-known framework for neural networks and uh, deep learning. And uh, so our idea was to provide a, a sort of interface uh, to um, uh, bridge the pipeline of m &E and e and TensorFlow so that uh, it's intuitive uh, and it's error prone. Uh, so uh, we implemented some uti some uh, basic utilities uh, for machine learning specific pre-processing of uh, uh, MEG data and EEG data as well. Uh, domain specific utilities like leave one subject out cross-validation for example because we focus mostly on uh, intra-subject studies and optimizing memory use and, and disk space. So the basic pipeline is like this. You can use MNE Python or in fact any other uh, signal processing software. Uh, we make use of the hard drive quite heavily. I will explain it in just a bit. So once you've done the basic EEG or MEG preprocessing that you want, uh, you save the intermediate results to, to the hard drive. Or if you use MNE Python, uh, you can use directly the MNE Epochs object. And then uh, basically the data in this uh, preprocessed way uh, enters into our workflow where we can do partitioning, augmentation, scaling, uh, label normalization, for example, and then basically transforms the data into a serialized string example, which optimizes the, the speed during the model training by quite a bit. 
Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's already the part of the TensorFlow framework. And that it also generates the metadata that allows iterating through, the, uh, through this serialized data set in quite efficient way. Uh, yeah, uh, and then uh, you basically can design a model or pick one of the implemented, uh, choose the optimizer, monitor the performance, uh, pick the hyperparameters and uh, monitor the performance uh, across the, like, the choices of, of, of hyperparameters. Uh, then you basically train the model, and the saved model gets, uh, uh, and the trained model gets saved to, to to the hard drive as well. And then you can use Emony, for example, for domain-specific visualization, like plotting topographies, doing source analysis, and stuff like that. Um, right. So, uh, why are we actually focusing so much uh, on the disk space? Uh, well, and why do we even use neural networks uh, at all? Because of all of these concerns that were just sound. Uh, it is known that they require large data sets, take a longer time to train than some good old machine learning. And sometimes good old machine learning is, is all you need. For example, SVMs in EEG and MEG uh, classification seem to be performing quite well. But maybe most annoyingly is this. Uh, so the, essentially the neural networks are the black boxes and, uh, and you don't really know what happens inside the box. Uh, so why the pain? And my answer to that uh, would be uh, that since we require large data set as well, e across subject generalization is actually what you need because uh, neural networks are basically models with unlimited capabilities. So if you have enough data, enough time, and enough patience, you can make it like, and if there exists a function that separates your, your classes uh, like perfectly, if there is some ground truth, you, you, like with all this time and patience, you can, you can actually find the model that does it. And across subject generalization is where the good old machine learning is not performing that well and there is a potential for neural networks. Right, so for example, like just a small example from uh, Amini flow, so because of the data format we can efficiently perform this one known subject uh, cross-validation, so it's basically a function where you provide a metadata file and it performs the, well basically trains the model on on n minus one subjects and that test it on, on the other. But one little, like really tiny thing, uh, which is uh, like the idea of, uh, of making things easier for the people who are maybe don't have too much experience in it, uh, is that basically a validation set takes a proportion uh, of each subject during the training and that way you don't, like, you, you reduce the, the variance of the estimate of this test guy by quite a bit. All right. So now I will introduce one of the models that we've been developing and it's been published uh, this year uh, very quickly. Uh, we decided to build our own classifier for MEG signals based on what we know about how the MEG is generated. And we know two things really, uh, is that the observations in the sensor space are produced by a small number of active and simultaneously active latent sources, which we don't observe directly. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, the time courses of these latent sources can be reasonably well approximated by a not regressive model. So the neural network, which is based on these two pieces of knowledge, would, would look like this. Uh, first, it computes some sort of spatial projection because uh, MEG has uh, a lot higher spatial resolution than EEG, so that makes a lot of sense. And then basically the, uh, the, one decon the set of 1D convolutional filters across time domain uh, try to capture the temporal dynamics of the latent sources. Uh, and then, basically, it's that, and the final layer is a classification layer with sparsity, so basically once we decorrelated the fe our features in uh, space and time, uh, we penalize the weights of this output classification layer, and that seemed to be producing quite, quite nice results. Uh, I would skip the interpretation, because it's probably, yeah, I'll just show you some results because of time. Uh, so we applied it to four different, uh, three different, different data sets, uh, as, mm, uh, one open and two private. Uh, and we showed that, for example, we were with five types of different evo sensory evoked responses, visual stimuli presented on the left and on the right, visual hemifield, some of the sensory stimulus, uh, so basically medial nerve stimulation of the left and the right arm, and auditory uh, tones presented either to the left or the right ear, this class is a combined one. Uh, we see that across subject performance of our model, which is a gray, I call it a gray box model, basically it's indicated by a gray box over here, uh, seems to be performing quite well ac across the benchmarks. Uh, and also you can explore the patterns uh, and by just picking the, uh, that contribute to the classification for each particular class of stimuli the most. 
and you can do a source analysis using m and &E and some tricks which were discussed already by many people before me. Uh, we did the same for a free class motor imagery task. Uh, same idea with the performance, but he, there we can also estimate spectral properties of the components. And then uh, Alex also actually uh, uh, like suggested to do one thing that will maybe move us even further. Uh, all right, and uh, we also did a test in real time. So we basically trained the model of, on these 18 subjects and then put uh, two new people in the scanner who wasn't on the test set and they were able to control the model uh, quite, quite accurately. All right, uh, so. Uh, Conclusions. Uh, con convolutional neural networks are well suited for a cross-subject classification. I hope you convinced that uh, you in that. And m and &E float uh, beta is now freely available on GitHub uh, with examples, documentation. And if you want to try it and you find something important for your research is missing, please contact us and give feedback on GitHub and we'll try to implement it. And of course, we're looking to contributors if you're like interested in developing this. And uh, with that, uh, I will skip the stuff and thank my collaborators and uh, and our group in Alto. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. Uh, questions. Uh, good evening, um, be so kind. Uh, can you explain? Uh, can we use uh, these methods uh, for? diagnostic processes uh, in clinical practice. For example, uh, for patients uh, with uh, uh, cognitive disorders. Uh, well, I know that there, there is quite a, lot Thank of, you. quite a lot of research happening in, the, in this field at the moment. Uh, uh, the model that I, that I was presenting is uh, for magnetoencephalography, so it's quite uh, quite expensive device. So we have in, in Russia, we have only one in Moscow MEG Center. Uh, I think uh, I'm not uh, very well aware of the uh, um, of the clinical uh, manifestations that uh, you can measure, or like from the brain activity in, in the condition. So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, there is definitely more research needed to answer your question, and uh, I don't even think that uh, I came across the studies that try to apply these methods to. Yeah, but if you're interested, we can of course discuss. Maybe I can um, ask something. So, because um, what, one thing that that I somehow uh, did, didn't understand about uh, in your uh, about your neural image paper was um, basically what you're doing is you have a spatial filter across all channels followed by convolutions over time, right? And um, which, which is well exactly what we're doing in our um, uh, deep. Uh, for network, and so first question would be: I don't see that anything is MEG specific about your approach. So both the the concept and the implementation, or is there anything I'm missing? Is there anything that is specific to MEG? Uh, yeah, well, I can uh, I can give you some deep knowledge uh, about this stuff. Just uh, the empirical observations that we had, we tried to apply this model to uh, EEG data, and it seems that EEG uh, models which uh, implement uh, the spatial filtering first and then the temporal filters uh, seem to perform better on EEG data, but our model seems to be doing well uh, on MEG data. I okay, but, that, but this is not in the paper, right? Because you are, I was yeah. somehow a, a bit surprised that you are comparing to our shallow implementation, but uh, the, the one comparison that I would have been really interested in to our Deep4 network, you, you didn't do. Is there a special reason why you only compared to the sh to our shallow represent, uh, architecture? Uh, uh, I think the only reason is that uh, by the time that we were writing the, uh, the manuscript and it, didn't, uh, it wasn't accepted to, to the first round, so uh, the implementation was only available for, for, for the shallow and we tried the deep one, but then uh, we it took, it took we put quite, quite both simultaneously on GitHub. No, I mean, uh, uh, we tried the shallow one and, uh, well, honestly, the representation, uh, like the, the, the training time, we, we didn't have uh, access to GPUs as well, and then even with the shallow network, it took quite a lot of time to train. Mm. Okay, so it was just a matter of time. Yeah, and of then time. I think in the, in the HBM paper, shallow net seemed to be performing better. Uh, I know what the... 
Yeah, yeah so we can try to uh, actually. The, it, it's one of the one of the uh, first priorities to implement uh, the, the papers by your group. Uh, oh, the, the 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 models uh, by your group and test it on our data as well. So, oh, okay, but um, yeah, well, um, may, maybe we can discuss yeah, some more yeah, sure. later on. And um, but I, I think it's really nice to to have. Um, and TensorFlow-based uh, toolbox as well, so we are using PyTorch, so I think it's good to ha have uh, diversity, and uh, so that's great. And um, yeah, any more questions about this thing here? Uh, okay, then, yeah, thanks again for the presentation. Can okay, I start? So yeah, now the next presentation is by Alexei uh, Korobov from... From Kazan. Thanks. Oh, <laughs> Thanks. On uh, joint processing of the signal from brain based on tensor al algebra. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alexey, and uh, uh, I'm working at uh, Kazan National Research Technical University. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. And um, our team uh, has been working in the field of biomedical signal processing. Uh, uh, more than um, uh, 30 years, and uh, we made uh, some successful projects, and one of them is uh, uh, we uh, made uh, telemedicine, telemedicine uh, portable device for arrhythmia control. And um, uh, six years ago, we opened uh, uh, inst uh, German uh, Russian Institute of New Techno of Advanced Technologies. Uh, with um, German universities, and in this pro in this institute, we opened new master program communications and signal processing with uh, Ilmenau uh, University um, of Technology, and uh, the chief of this master program from German side is Professor Martin Hart, and he and his laboratory work uh, in the field of uh, biomedical signal processing too, and. Uh, Today I want to present a few results of our joint projects and um, of course you know that uh, 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 recording uh, biomedical signals from, the, uh, from many sensors can uh, increase the accuracy and uh, it is a problem how to analyze these uh, signals, how to uh, design the model of the signals and uh, uh, to overcome this problem uh, tensor algebra can help us and um, what what is the tensor tensor is a multi-dimensional array and um, it, it is an extension of uh, vectors or matrices and uh, we can apply uh, tensor algebra and decompose these tensors into factors so, um, uh, for example, canonical poly polyadic decomposition can decompose uh, uh, multidimensional array into sum of independent uh, co uh, vectors and identity uh, tensor. And another type of decomposition is uh, uh, is Tucker decomposition and. Um, uh, this kind of decomposition uh, uh, decompose uh, multi-dimensional array into uh, core tensor S and uh, uh, matrices U that uh, include um, unitary vectors. So, uh, uh, and uh, um, obviously that um, if we can record uh, signals, biomedical signals from different uh, types of sensors simultaneously, it can uh, help us to increase accuracy too. And uh, the next technique is, um, uh, is decomposition of um, uh, fusion dat data. And, uh, for example, in this case, we can use coupled uh, uh, CP decomposition that is based on alternating, uh, alternating uh, least squares. But this technique uh, has uh, some disadvantages, and our colleagues from Ilmenau uh, proposed a new framework 
that is based on uh, semi-algebraic uh, semi framework and uh, simultaneously matrix diagonalization. And uh, this technique was extended to uh, fusion data. And um, I will skip uh, some slides with your permission. And um, yes, and um, how can we um, how can we use uh, this technique for biomed to, to biomedical signal processing? Uh, intermittent photon stimulation is used for uh, different. Uh, uh, um, in, in, in different uh, clinical uh, uh, studies um, of different uh, diseases like uh, Alzheimer or schizophrenia and uh, uh, um, and uh, during um, during um, voting stimulation uh, um, re repetitive voting stimulation, uh, we can uh, um, we can uh, see the voting drying effect. Um, the voting during this effect, uh, the amplitude of uh, response is enlarged, and uh, uh, on the fr uh, stimulation frequencies close to alpha individual alpha frequency and uh, the half of uh, individual alpha frequency. Uh, uh, so uh, we recorded um, uh, we recorded uh, simultaneously AG and MEG signals from tw 12 volunteers in a biomagnetic center of University Hospital in Jena, and uh, after that um, we implemented tensor decomposition. And on this slide you can see um, the structure of simulations. Uh, simulations uh, consist uh, 20 blocks for each uh, stimulation frequency and um, before it um, the individual alpha frequency was estimated. So after that uh, we pre uh, make pre-processing of this data, we uh, calculated uh, wavelet decomposition and uh, used um, um, the results of wavelet decomposition of as um, as uh, uh, slices, and we stacked uh, these slices into two tensors for AEG and MEG data. And uh, the dimension dimensionality of these tensors are frequency, time, and channels. And uh, after that, we um, uh, apply, uh, we implemented a uh, couple sex decomposition uh, and decompose and analyze uh, results. So, and uh, uh, on this slide you can see um, uh, um, as results for, for example, for volunteer three. And uh, you can see, uh, you can see uh, a special distribution on the left side and you can see a distribution uh, in frequency domain and in time domain and uh, uh, for example, in time domain, we can see, uh, we clearly, clearly see, clearly see uh, uh, ec mm, that uh, um, amplitude is, enrol is enrolled, and uh, uh, we can see go good response of uh, of a volunteer, and we can see two components on the frequencies uh, on the frequencies. Uh, half uh, the alpha individual alpha frequency and uh, on the alpha frequency and uh, uh, on the special distribution we can see that um, uh, amplitude is in 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 uh, uh, on the occipital zone. For example, for uh, volunteer five, we can see the same result and uh, yes, the same. But uh, yes, uh, uh, in this case, the stimulation frequency is close to individual alpha frequency, and we don't see the component uh, on the AG data, but we can see two components on the MEG data, and it can uh, it means that MEG data inc uh, have uh, information about response. 
and uh, for example, volunteer eight, uh, we can see again uh, two components. But uh, for example, on the frequency close to on the stimulation frequency close to alpha frequency, uh, we can see that uh, the second component is uh, is a little bit wrong uh, wrong because uh, we should see a response on the occipital zone. So uh, the same and uh, conclusion. So uh, we can I can summarize that uh, couple sexy framework that was proposed in uh, our by our colleagues in Luminal is robust and uh, it can. Uh, give us good opportunity to uh, extract uh, extract uh, features of the signals from AG and MEG data, and we reduced dimensionality of the data. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank thank you for another example that tensor decomposition is really powerful method. Yeah, and uh, are there uh, questions? So what, what maybe then one question for me? Uh, so what's your future perspective? So where where do you want to move on now? Yes, yeah, so we want to um, uh, to extend our framework for more tensors, more than two tensors, because uh, in this uh, research uh, we um, rec recorded uh, simultaneously AG data, MEG data, and data from gradiometers. So we can uh, fuse this data and decompose simultaneously, and of course it can uh, increase the accuracy of decomposition. <laughs> so it's our next steps. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no, no more questions, then uh, thanks again. Thank you very much. I think we uh, have just lost one presentation on the way so and are, are you now ready great so <clears throat> the next and uh, last presentation of the session will be by Kate Contra Teva from uh, Skoltech on psychoneurological disorders diagnostics based on MRI and fMRI. Uh, sorry for that confusion with slides at the very beginning because we uh, decided to switch with Maxim. Uh, he was introducing our uh, lab research, like uh, uh, he was giving the overview. And I will be going only with the um, MRI based classifiers mostly. So it is a very hot topic here in autumn because I will uh, talk about the depression and then the psychiatric disorder disorders classification. So uh, I'm from the Skoltech neuroscience team, uh, the second year PhD student there. And the motivation behind the building these uh, prognostic models on MRI data is because they are widely spread and there is um, a lack of um, objective clinical tests. So Psychoneurological means neurological, it's like affecting the brain tissue, so it's epilepsy or stroke, and uh, psychiatric, it's like um, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and etc. So, uh, as for now, depression diagnosis is based on the previous experience of the doctor, and um, we're trying to do an objective test and to give a measurement of this pathology and find the biomarker. So the whole pipeline um, on MRI data started from the MRI data acquisition. And uh, why MRI? It's because it's widely spread and considered potentially harmlessness. So we can do it in children and for multiple time examination. So we can go uh, exploring not only brain anatomy as a brain function as well. So the whole pipeline could, could be described as this. Data acquisition, then pre-processing, machine learning pipeline, and then the interpretation. The interpretation is really crucial uh, because no, in the healthcare applications, um, for sure, because as a recommended system, doctor expect us to give us not a black box, but something which will highlight the biomarker or specific point of the disease. 
So take a closer look at the data context. You probably know it, but uh, structural data is a 3D tensor. Functional MRI, it is 4D uh, matrix. So the repetition of this 3D scan uh, with the lower resolution. And uh, uh, I will be talk talking about the structural data and functional, but DTI also goes in here. It could be tackled as a 3D and uh, then uh, treated with a tractography al analysis. So this type of data could be classified either with a full data size, uh, with the deep neural networks as we know, or uh, with extracting specific features. The features will explain the particular uh, brain um, function or structure uh, Anat anatomy. So, um, starting with the structural data, uh, yeah, <laughs> working with the brain imaging is good that you can um, take samples from yourself. You can see my brain is the unprocessed data, the structural one, and then it's canonical. Canonically, it's uh, pre-processed to do the MNI normalization, you know, all this pipeline. And then we can, as I said, treat it as a 3D image and classify it with the convolutional neural network. In our group, we are using VoxCNN and VoxResNet. They were proposed like three years ago, so mostly ancient for, for, the, for the deep learning society. And how do we interpreting them? We are building uh, the attention map for the last fully connected layer, so to say. And um, here it is highlighted red. And the doctor can see which voxels are relevant for the network. So as I said, it could be treated either full size or with the features. Features explaining the brain. Uh, but the full size, also we were playing uh, with the different preprocessing stages and the receptive field of the uh, of the kernel to field. Uh, the idea behind them is that we are able to learn patterns more efficiently if we, with the very beginning, will target needed pattern, uh, transforming the receptive field. So it was considered that the deep learning network should treat the full size imagery being processed. But for us, it appeared that deformable ones can tackle image without any preprocessing. That's the thing. Uh, the, if you will see the left-hand side imagery, the first two were classified for schizophrenia classification with the same accuracy. Uh, and normalization, even though, lead to the lack of accuracy. So the normalized image is the third one. And uh, we saw that the classification accuracy falls with the, this image normalization. It was really interesting. So another approach is to do feature engineering or morphometrical analysis. Maybe you know, doctors now are asked to, even though ask, to um, attach the measurement of some region to the diagnosis. Like this region, like patient has a hippocampal asymmetry because of that and that. And it is done by open source software, mostly. And so we were doing the same, then classifying the feature as a vector, and then uh, extracting the most relevant ones, just scoring them. Um, functional data. Functional data is much more tricky. In my brain, you can see it's not so nice and uh, because the resolution is worse. So fMRI data in opposite should undergo the pre-processing. In our lab, we're doing the IC denoising. It's canonical and very powerful. Could be done by subject or in the group. So uh, again, my brain's with the resting state and motor-based, uh, task-based. How we can tackle them? Take, again, 3D neural network, uh, convolve them, and then the record part. It was mentioned that this CNN then RNN uh, is a really powerful thing, and it is 
it works in our case as well for schizophrenia classification, and it also could be interpreted. So here you can see the meaning, meaningful perturbation, or just Google Deep Explain, and um, this type of the, even such a tricky and heavy networks, they also could be interpreted. Or we can do feature engineering, it's canonical approach, of functional con connectivity analysis, or try to correlate brain regions by their time series. And then we are classifying again the features and scoring them, finding the most relevant for the, like SVM or logistic regression, whatever. So the pipeline for fMRI data for us is like take the full size data, then extract in, in the time series, correlate them, and we have guys who, who are treating the uh, functional connectivity matrix as itself, binarizing, building causality measures, and even graph kernels. There are different topics and could be interpreted very tricky. Again, I'm not going in that. So the results. I was saying that there's two main approaches uh, on the structural and functional data classification. So the 3D uh, classification models for us work perfectly for the uh, fMRI data. So it seems for us, we were working with a bipolar disorder, measure depression, schizophrenia, and epilepsy mostly. Uh, we found that the fMRI data is uh, more informative. Firstly, the feature extraction uh, work this, uh, the same or a little bit uh, less accurate as uh, uh, convolutional networks. And structural data is less informative for the psychiatric disorders, but still informative for the neurological ones, uh, as for epilepsy. So we are going both uh, with the classification accuracy on uh, full-size data and on uh, features. And it's very important to do the accurate pre-processing on fMRI data, and we so accidentally so that it is not necessary for structural data. Uh, so that is pretty much it. And as I said, I have my own brain scans. So I have my own scores. Uh, it is like 0.1 for schizophrenia and <laughs> 0.4 for bipolar. My colleague said that it's like exactly the number needed for interesting life. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so here I am like the person who can build on the open source data this network, then just go to in vitro, pay them, uh, get my scan, classify myself, get the score. And I was curious, who, who is like, who is interesting to do it for yourself? Can you please like, for my curiosity, raise your hand, like, who will do it if it will be open source? Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm finishing. I just wanted, okay, yeah, of course, there is, uh, it is um, really a lot of obstacles, and this course is like, I am asking you to think how can I personally relate to this course and ask questions about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. I think this was a very beautiful presentation to conclude our session today, and um, are there any questions, how to have an interesting life, maybe? <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, as I understand, uh, uh, one part of your work was uh, like to optimize the process, so you shouldn't like uh, deep learn whole brain, whole image, but you just have set of features which like uh, shorten the process and optimize. Uh, am I right? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, like I will repeat it and you will correct me. So uh, we are going through two pipelines simultaneously, raw imagery with pre-processing in ca case of fMRI, it's resting state ones, and then the feature extracting. And then we have different points of view on the result interpretation. So my, my question was, uh, well, um, uh, how much uh, this process optimize like just a, a, a role deep learning uh, process. As I understand, it should be faster, but uh, how much and uh, uh, how, how does it matter a lot? Well, okay, uh, for structural data, we're going with a free surfer. It will take for one core uh, five to 11 hours per patient. 
So it's intensive, yeah, it's consuming uh, for, free, for structural data. Um, for functional data, we're using fMRI prep. It's like three hours per patient. We're working with the data sets of hundreds of patients. You can imagine how we're, yeah, so it's a mess. Uh, for fMRI data, I'm not observing uh, for now any fast uh, pre-processing or avoiding this pre-processing. For structural data, just avoiding pre-processing, uh, doing NII to uh, DICOM to NII, and then directly to the classifier. It works for now for deformable cones. So you're saving five hours per patient, but not for fMRI. Any more <laughs> questions? Yeah. Uh, maybe any explanations about the false positive, false negative? Have you explored that field? Uh, well, it is a pain. As for now, we are uh, validating our models with Rokauk, uh, five fold, three repeats for deep learning. You can imagine how messy it is. It's like uh, the classifiers on features, we're validating them with a leaf one out, bootstrap, and doing more repeats on them. For each model, we have four scores, obviously with this false positive or false negative, but from the very beginning, we're starting with the area under rock uh, to, to just close this issue with the accuracy because I've seen a lot of papers doing just like, we have um, sensitivity 99, and that's it. Thank you. So, yeah, then uh, thank you again for the nice presentation. Yeah, thanks to you. <laughs>